Thank you. So I'd just like you to think for a moment about how weird this is. I'm an Australian giving a presentation in India about a programming language invented in the Netherlands, named after a British sketch comedy group, and legally backed by an American public interest charity. That's weird. It's also very cool. For all our cultural differences, for all the complications of history and global politics, we can at least agree on the fact that we enjoy solving problems with Python and that we all collectively benefit when we work together to improve it and the ecosystem around it. And it's also fascinating. I'm not an anthropologist or an economist or a political scientist, but I'm an open source practitioner with a vested interest in the sustainability and growth of open source ecosystems in general and the Python ecosystem in particular. And that means paying attention to how open collaboration models intersect with other social, financial, and political systems. And in particular, the fact that open collaboration creates global opportunities, like just on that first slide, five different countries. And so, at least in principle, collaborating online should make our systems and processes accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Unfortunately, we know from experience that reality is more complicated than that. Just because an opportunity exists doesn't mean people are going to be in a position to take advantage of it. And so what we find that there's actually lots and lots of external factors that influence who chooses to participate in our online communities. Uh, and it's not only a question of who chooses to participate at all or who even attempts to participate but it also has a major impact on who stays and continues to participate further over time. So if we start trying to think about what some of those factors are, the first two that intuitively occur to a lot of people is that, oh well, it's about interest, it's about ability. It's, it's like, uh, why do people want to collaborate? How, do they, how can they contribute? Uh, and so if you ask participants in a lot of open communities, they'll tell you, everyone with the relevant interest and ability is already here. Uh, I'm going to tell you that, no, they're almost certainly wrong. Um, but, in, but when you're approaching things from this mindset, the assumption is if people aren't participating, then they're assumed to either lack the interest or they lack the relevant abilities. And so that's why they're not there. Uh, and the thing is that people will often say this even if you look at their contributor community and say, hey, that's starkly different from your user community. Like, it does not represent your user base. Uh, and it really doesn't represent the potential user base, like basically everyone in the world. Uh, and so if you ever hear anyone utter the phrase, it's a pipeline problem, uh, when challenged on skewed demographics in their communities, um, this is almost certainly the mindset they're coming from. It's like they're saying, no, it's about getting the people with the interest and ability uh, in, uh, involved. Uh, and they're not asking themselves the question of, well, hang on, what about the people who do have the interest and do have the ability, but aren't there anyway? And so, if we dig a little deeper, we find there are some other major factors that influence participation in collaborative communities. Um, so, one of the key ones is just access. Like, where would the collaboration actually takes place? Uh, and so this can refer to specific tooling choices around communication. Um, it can refer to language barriers. Uh, it can refer to time zone barriers. Uh, and it can refer to opportunities for offline collaboration. Um, so one that comes up very often with uh, single vendor commercially sponsored open source uh, is that quite in many cases, only people working for the company sponsoring the project are really in a position to influence major decisions. Like the decision, key decisions, uh, people may have the opportunity to contribute, but they don't have the opportunity to influence the overall direction of the project. Beyond access, uh, we have a situation that for any volunteer community, uh, the availability of free time and a willingness to invest it in that particular community is always going to be a key constraint. Uh, and this can especially be a challenge when mixing paid full-time professionals with casual volunteers. Uh, but it's also something where when we look at wider society, free time's not evenly distributed. It's like, it's quite often a sign of relative uh, wealth. Uh, it's a sign of not having other social commitments, like 
supporting children or supporting elderly relatives. Uh, and so, again, this is something that can skew our demographics in ways we don't intend. And then the final factor that I want to consider today uh, is this question of energy, uh, and in particular, emotional energy. Uh, and it refers to the fact that when contributors are having to invest time and energy in simply defending their right to be actively involved in a community, they're less likely to remain engaged. It's like, I'm having to fight to be here. Well, how much do I really want to be here? Maybe I'll just move on and do something else that I find more rewarding. Um, and so when you consider these additional factors, uh, while I didn't come up with the phrase myself, there's a very apt summary uh, which basically says, your pipeline is leaky and full of acid. Um, so what can we do? It's like, so we, we basically know from experience that left to its own devices, a growing collaborative community is actually a recipe for maintain of frustration and burnout as the demands of the task begin to exceed the time they have available for it. But at the same time, it isn't reasonable for us to expect volunteers that are doing something good for the world. They're saying, hey, I'm happy to share this with the world. Use it if you like it. Um, it isn't reasonable to expect them to, everyone to be willing to switch from treating their personal side project as a hobby to treating it as an unpaid second job. And so that gets us to this little chart here. And this is a scaling model that it's been found to work better than anything else we've tried so far. Uh, and it basically involves having a mix of volunteer contributors and paid participants with projects structured to ensure that influence over the project direction is shared between the two groups. Um, this is, it's sufficiently complex that it only makes sense at above a certain scale. But the nice thing about it is different folks care about different things uh, and have varying amounts of time to devote to particular areas. Uh, and so when we break things up into contributors and colleagues, clients and customers, we're offering four very different ways of directly engage, directly or indirectly engaging with an open community. Now, I want to be clear, this is not an immediate or simple fix. It's like the growing pains required for a project to get to this scale are quite impressive uh, and it takes a long time, uh, but it has the key benefit of introducing institutions into the system that can be encouraged to invest actively in improving community management practices and addressing some of those concerns around time and access and energy that I mentioned earlier, that it isn't necessarily appropriate to challenge volunteers over. Diving into these categories a little bit further, one of the key distinctions I make between contributors and colleagues in open source is that contributors don't have any particular, uh, contributors are offered the opportunity to have an impact, but don't have any specific responsibilities. Uh, and so projects have the authority to decline to accept attentive contributions and to define the criteria for including contributions. But whether or not the payoff in personal experience or impact on the project for meeting those, uh, getting past those gates is worth the time, that's a question that's left up to each individual contributor. And so students, academics, established industry professionals, retirees, and folks that simply enjoy tinkering with code are great candidates for getting involved in open source as volunteer contributors. But not my circus, not my monkeys is a wonderful Polish saying for disclaiming responsibility for resolving a problem. And so when asking contributors to volunteer their time on something, it's essential to remember the principle of no obligation without compensation. The only real obligation for individual contributors is to respect community codes of conduct. And when we don't even want to do that, well, we have the entire rest of the internet to play in. So, however, once folks accumulate responsibilities in a community, the time commitments start to add up, uh, and sustainability requires finding ways to get paid for that work. And one of the interesting things is that it's important for us to care about the sustainability of our peers' community involvement and support those folks in managing their stress levels. And now colleagues, in the sense I'm talking about here, may not be employees of the same company. They may work for trade associations, nonprofit foundations, 
competing redistributors, companies that are running self-supported instances of the project, consulting companies that rely on the project, and many more. But the big thing here, more time, more responsibility, more commitment. But how do we get money into the system? It's like, it's like all, well, all well and good say, well, we want people to be paid to do this. Um, and to make money in open source, the key question is generally, genuine, generally not what do you want to build. Rather, the kinds of questions you need to be asking are whose problems are you planning to solve? Why should they trust you to solve them? Now, the most obvious form of this uh, is open source based software consulting businesses that literally have clients. Uh, and in those cases, the client pays the business to solve their problems the business invests time in, up, in open source tooling to help them solve client issues. But there are other less obvious forms. Uh, so for example, organizations that run self-supported open source software. Like an awful lot of open source software these days is actually maintained by big public cloud companies. Uh, and those cloud companies aren't doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it because their engineers like it, uh, and they're doing it because it helps them run their business. Uh, and then a third form that we see, particularly in the scientific Python community, uh, is in the form of philanthropic grants, uh, where there's grant-making uh, grant organizations out there with an interest in uh, sustaining open source development, uh, and people are able to apply to those and say, well, we'll feel to feed the money back into the system in an effective way. However, funding based on specific clients or benefactors can work well at smaller scale, but it tends to struggle to create the kind of referring, recurring funding needed to sustain hundreds or thousands of people working on open source projects. And so in these contexts, the key business development task is figuring out what folks are ready, willing, and able to pay for that you're prepared to invest time and money in delivering. Now, while my own experience with this is generally in the context of commercial clients and customers, both from the customer perspective and the redistributor side, um, there are also examples of it working well with nonprofit organizations. Uh, and if we consider things like MediaWiki, um, which is the technology that powers Wikipedia, uh, and the Wikimedia Foundation, which supports both of them, uh, as well as cases like Mozilla and Firefox. Uh, and, so, and so, while it's by no means assured, these kinds of in institutional involvement can make for much healthier and more enjoyable collaborative communities. And so, for the rest of this talk, what I'm going to do is run through some examples uh, of how this model can help us get the outcomes we'd like from the opportunities that open collaboration models create. So on the interest front, the most common motivation for people getting involved in open source as a contributor is having a particular problem that we want solved such as a specific bug we want fixed or a new feature that we really wish was available by default. So, and in a healthy collaborative ecosystem, opportunities exist for clients and customers that choose to do so to become contributors representing their own interests directly. And this is the single biggest difference that distinguishes uh, open communities from proprietary ones. That if people really want to, they can make the jump to being a contributor uh, without going to work for the vendor. Uh, and so, a specific example of that uh, is a personal example. Uh, the original version of the context lib module um, in the Python standard library uh, included a nested context manager. Uh, so, contextlib.nested, list a bunch of context managers, uh, it would enter them all uh, and, uh, and then release them all at the end of the block. This turned out to have a design flaw that encouraged resource leaks because if you were doing things like opening files, you would open all of the files before you entered the context manager, which means if you had a bug opening one of the later ones, you'd leak all the resources uh, already acquired. Uh, and so as a result, we removed it entirely uh, when, um, when syntactic support for context manager nesting was added directly to the with statement. The thing was though, by doing that, we lost the ability to dynamically compose a list of context managers that we wanted to use. Uh, and I, I missed that feature and I wanted it back. Uh, and so I, had the, I was able to iterate on ideas in contextlib2 until I came up with the API design uh, for contextlib.exitStack 
able to add that back into the standard library. Uh, and lo and behold, we have the ability to dynamically manage context managers again. Now, because this is all about individual motivations and individuals choosing to co co commit their time to solve their own problems, uh, I think this is the area where I think institutional involvement actually makes the least, di least difference. Um, because this, this is kind of the original open source, the developers scratching their own itches, contributors solving their own problems. Um, however, uh, one of the big things institutional involvement does do uh, is it brings a lot more users into the community uh, and those users in turn become potential future contributors. Where things get more interesting, I think, is when we're starting to talk about cases like helping to, uh, starting to talk about helping to solve other people's problems rather than just solving our own. Uh, and so for folks that are paid specifically to work uh, in collaborative communities, the goal is generally to meet the needs of their employer or their employer's customers rather than to pursue their own interests. And even for volunteers, uh, our goal may be to meet the needs of a particular user community that we value uh, for our own personal reasons. Uh, and so, for example, an awful lot of my family uh, works in education. Uh, and so I really enjoy having opportunities uh, to help folks that are using Python for education and for scientific research. Uh, and I'm definitely not the only one who feels that way. So, and in this context, the solid base of funded contributors can also help facilitate the contribution and collaboration process for everyone else. Um, so a simple, a, a simple, relatively recent example for this, um, one of the ongoing challenges we face with people just learning Python uh, is teaching them that the random module really shouldn't be used for anything except simulations and games. Uh, if you need genuinely unguessable randomness, um, the random module's not the right thing because it's designed to have a certain amount of predictability to it so that simulations can be reproduced. Uh, and historically our answer to this has been to direct people to a variety of one-line recipes that implement the particular behaviors that they need. Uh, that's not especially user-friendly uh, and it is basically an opportunity, uh, uh, it basically leads to a lot of actual security bugs in actual applications. And so what we did in Python 3.6 is the Python 3.6 standard library now includes a new secrets module. The secrets module is in fact just a, collect, a collection of all those recipes that have been around for years and saying, here is how to do this thing securely. Uh, and all we've done is we've given them names, we've put them in the standard library and we've given uh, as a single module that's easy to find. And so what the hope of that is, is that over time, use the secrets module will become the obvious and correct answer to generating security sense of random values in Python. Now this is one of those things where those of us that are already core developers, we don't actually need this. It's like, we know don't use the random module for security sensitive numbers, use these other recipes instead. But it's one of those things that's very hard to document, leads to lots of scary warnings in the standard library, uh, and basically, uh, basically, and fairly prompts newcomers to be going, well, why is this so difficult? Why isn't this easy? Um, and so hopefully with the secrets module, that question will go away. They go, oh, this is easy. I use the secrets module. I get my security sense of numbers. Everything's fine. But then the third category is sometimes we have money available to invest in solving a problem, but only limited availability of our own time, that of our peers in our organization, or we simply don't have the expertise to do what we want to get done. Uh, and so in these cases especially, organizations have a lot of opportunities to invest in supporting open source projects and tailoring them to their needs, uh, either by hiring open source developers specifically to work on the relevant upstream projects, or else by working with open source vendors that invest appropriately in sustaining those upstream communities. And as a concrete example of this, uh, institutional open source users regularly want to run open source community, open source components for longer than the upstream community is willing to support them. Uh, who here still wants to support Python 2.4? Yeah, so technically that doesn't, 
RHEL 5 is still supported until March. And then that will be the last supported version of Python 2.4 will finally wander off into the sunset and there will be much rejoicing. Um, and it can be reasonable to do this, but you need to invest in watching the upstream uh, project closely for security problems and backboard any relevant fixes. Uh, and actually doing this involves a significant time commitment and isn't inherently rewarding enough to attract volunteer efforts. Uh, and so it's a really common service for commercial redistributors to offer to clients and uh, customers. Uh, and then the money from that then serves the development of future versions, which then themselves fold into long-term support, and, and so the cycle keeps going. But that's just looking at the interest side of things. What happens when we start looking at ability? Now, in open source communities, we have a tendency to treat the source code as the only essential element. And to be frank, in the early days of open source, that was even arguably true. Having an open source option available at all was sufficiently rare that there wasn't much opportunity for potential users to be choosy. It was, use the open source one, no matter how badly documented it was, or go pay lots of money for the proprietary thing. Uh, and so, that was basically the way things were for a long time. Times change though, and we're now counting the number of available open source projects, uh, a number of available open source components in the millions, rather than in the thousands or even the tens of thousands. And in that context, design, documentation, quality assurance, and effective community management have a major influence on project adoption and impact. So, and I'm gonna reuse one of the examples that Stephen used this morning. Uh, one of the uh, events like this one simply aren't possible without the significant number of volunteers that contribute to making them happen. And in addition to sponsoring these events directly, organizations engaged with the relevant communities also often al allow the use of work time, both to attend the event, uh, speak at the event, to participate in organizing events. Uh, they may also offer meeting spaces, meeting spaces to organizers in the lead up to events, uh, and sometimes even participate in hosting the event itself. Uh, and outside, even outside conf large, larger conferences like this one, many Python community meetups and workshops are also hosted in the offices of local organizations that use Python uh, and are happy to give uh, uh, something back to the community that way. What about those more complex ones? The ones where people have the interest, they have the ability, but other factors are limiting their ability to participate. Uh, and a very big one on the access side of things, uh, uh, one that poses significant challenges, uh, is the degree to which meeting in person can accelerate the process of establishing trust at a personal level, and hence gain additional influence in a community. Uh, and this is one that, like video, people say, oh, what about video conferencing? And it's not the same, because video conferences are still gonna usually be related to a specific topic. You're not gonna be meeting somebody at lunch and talking about something random that's only tangentially related to the conference. You're not going to have those opportunities to chat to people as people, rather than as colleagues or potential contributors, uh, and so on and so forth. And, the, and like Hans uh, mentioned this in his keynote yesterday, the fact that we're more willing to trust people we've actually met, it's not something we can really alter. It's an inherent part of being human. It's like try, trying, to, trying to convince us not to trust people we've met more than people we haven't would like be asking the tide nicely to not come in. Um, and so, again, this is an area where institutions can help. Uh, and so, for uh, example, financial aid and scholarship programs for conferences aim to reduce the cost of travel and accommodation as a barrier to participating in major community events. Um, and also, the growing number of regional Python events, such as this one, uh, also help to build connections within and between communities more effectively, rather than attempting to try and get everybody to the original PyCon in the US every year. Uh, one of the other things that can make a big difference uh, is folks getting to attend events as employer-funded business trips, uh, 
rather than having to attend on their own time and on their own dollar. Uh, so, and so, yeah, it's, I, I love events like this one and getting a chance to meet people I otherwise never would. So, I honestly don't know what to do about this one. But, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so English is a prerequisite. Uh, there's generally not a lot of we can do about it in the context of open source projects that already have established default languages for collaboration. Uh, so English for Python, Japanese for Core Ruby, those are pretty much locked in and uh, are unlikely to ever change. However, uh, tr things like translated documentation, localized applications can make a huge difference at the level of individual applications and making things usable for more wider audiences. Uh, and we're also in the situation where local community workshops, user groups, and regional conferences can help avoid requiring English up front, uh, even if it will still be useful later. Uh, so for example, I was recently in the Czech Republic. Uh, the local Python meetups there, conducted in Czech, uh, unless Australians happen to be in the room visiting. Um, uh, and Django World's workshop, Django's Girls workshops in Brno, uh, also conducted in Czech. Uh, and so it means that people can get started in their native language uh, and put off worrying about the English side of things until later if it's something they feel they need for what they want to do. However, uh, in addition to that kind of thing, uh, institutions themselves can also structure themselves to help mitigate this problem. Uh, and taking some concrete examples from the PSF uh, and its history over the last few years, uh, so English is well established as the default language used to integrate with the Python Software Foundation, uh, and that's unlikely to change just based on the staff, history of the community, all that sort of stuff. Uh, however, if you go look at the charter for the PSF Grants Working Group, uh, you'll find that it explicitly calls out six different regions of the globe uh, that must have at least one member each. Uh, and so this means that folks are more likely to find somebody uh, it, it becomes easier to get more language communities represented in the grants committee uh, than if it was entirely concentrated in the United States. Uh, the PSF is also currently continu continuing a trial program in South America uh, for finding a scalable model for an ambassador program uh, that allows the PSF to have designated regional representatives that can help people in their dealings with the PSF. Um, and with things like the grants application program, uh, PSF membership, PSF elections, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and it, with any luck, if that program uh, does, does prove successful and does grow, we may eventually get to a point where most folks around the world will be able to collaborate with official representatives of the PSF in their native language uh, with the PSF ambassadors taking care of the problem of translating it to English for communication back to the PSF board. Um, that's very much a work in progress, but it's one of the things I'm very excited to see how it develops over the coming years. Uh, so, access, interest, ability, access, time. Just keeping up with complex design discussions on project mailing lists can be incredibly time consuming. Uh, institutions like Linux Weekly News, vendor blogs, they can summarize these discussions in a way that makes things easy to follow for less engaged observers. Uh, however, communities can also incorporate this activity as an explicit part of their structured decision making processes. Uh, and so one Stephen referred to in his presentation this morning uh, is the Python enhancement proposal process. And one of the key purposes of PEPs uh, is to allow people to just follow and respond to the PEP updates rather than having to read every single related mailing list message. Some of us do that anyway because we have to make questionable time allocation decisions. Um, but it means that people can understand the decision making process, understand why certain things were done, why certain things were not done, without actually going through every single uh, mailing list message that relates to the topic. Uh, and these persistent summaries also make it easier for new contributors joining language development community later to get up to speed on the history of particular design decisions. 
And then one of the other key aspects, of course, is that open source isn't developed by magic internet pixies. Uh, and contributors still need to eat, still need somewhere to sleep, uh, and so on and so forth. And like one of the most obvious ways that uh, institutions can help with this is through full-time employment, part-time employment, and paid internships working on open source projects. However, there are a few other interesting things they can do uh, to help out. And some specific examples of that. Uh, so Outreachy, uh, now run by the Software Freedom Conservancy, uh, is a program that offers paid and open source internships to members of groups that are broadly underrepresented in open source and free software communities. Uh, really interesting program. Uh, applications are currently open, I think. Uh, my apologies if that's wrong, but go have a look. Uh, they, they have great information on their website about the program and how to participate both as a sponsoring organization and as a, a participant. Um, so who, see, who here has actually heard of Outreachy before? Okay, a few. Um, uh, who here has heard of Google Summer of Code? Okay, th th this one's better known. Uh, so Google Summer of Code uh, is something Google started several years ago now. Uh, and it's, a, uh, it's designed for, um, it's designed to introduce students to open source communities and open source development models. Uh, by offering them essentially a summer job uh, and, and runs, runs over the Northern Hemisphere summer uh, and uh, involves coordinating um, uh, mentors and sponsors in the open source communities, support uh, college-age students that are participating uh, and they basically get to learn uh, learn various things about the open source community uh, and uh, software development while the participating projects get things done that they may not have otherwise had time to do themselves. Uh, and then the final one I'm going to mention uh, is the Mozilla Open Source Support Grants. Uh, and this is an example, uh, this is a general grants program for existing open source projects uh, where they can apply to Mozilla for grants for specific purposes to achieve specific ends. Um, and that's, again, a very interesting program that has the potential to do a lot of good for a lot of communities. And then finally, we'll look at the question of energy uh, and the question of how do we actually encourage more inclusive collaboration? Because the thing is, when your goal is to diversify a previously relative homogeneous group, it generally isn't sufficient to just say, we welcome anyone. Uh, and the reason is that it's like, if the historical trend has resulted in such a homogeneous group, why should anyone believe you when you say, we welcome anyone? It's like, well, that's not anyone. And so, what, it, what happens is it becomes necessary to make a convincing case to people that you're not just looking for token participation to tick a, there, we have diversity now, box. Uh, and you're instead genuinely looking to expand the scope of participation in your community. Now, explicitly documenting expected standards of behavior in the form of codes of conduct is a beneficial step in that process, but it's far from being sufficient on its own. And so, I'm gonna expand mention a couple of specific examples that have helped a lot. Uh, so PyLadies was founded in 2011 in Los Angeles uh, and has since expanded to have more than 60 chapters around the world, including the one in Pune that we heard about earlier. Um, and then Django Girls uh, was founded in 2014 and has since hosted workshops in 68 different countries, more than 200 different cities, reaching thousands of women around the world. And the impact of these and other efforts can be seen in the changing demographics of speaker lineups and event attendance, where we're starting to see things far more balanced, become far more balanced than they once were. Although there's also clearly still a long way to go. And then again, on the energy front, one of the things that institutions can provide is the ability to formally acknowledge community contributions. And it, while it may sound like a small thing, it can make a surprisingly big difference when organizations say to volunteers, 
we recognize your contributions and we appreciate them. And now, one of the most sincere forms of acknowledgement is like, here's a job offer or here's a promotion. Um, but there's also a lot of other things that organizations can do to acknowledge the efforts of volunteer contributors. Uh, and so one specific one that I want to mention uh, is the PSF Community Service Awards program. So who's actually heard of that? I think I got like three hands. Um, okay, so the PSF Community Service Awards, uh, they're granted on a quarterly basis to recipients that the uh, board acknowledges as having performed a significant service or services of, uh, on behalf of the wider community. Uh, and so since 2008, more than 60 awards have been made uh, for contributions ranging from maintaining the PSF's collaboration infrastructure, organizing and supporting community conferences, uh, developing key promotional material for the community uh, in the form of the PSF brochure, uh, coordinating the PSF's participation in the B BBC Microbit project, uh, and curating the large collection of Python conference videos maintained at pyvideo.org. Like those are just some of the things people have received the community service award for over the years. And so one of the most, one of the things I find most interesting uh, about the idea of more expansive communities is that they then offer ever more expansive, uh, ever more avenues for us to explore at a personal level. So Honda, Honda covered some of his own career journey yesterday. Uh, so for myself, open source has allowed me to make the jump from uh, an embedded signal processing developer uh, to, uh, to working on supply chain management tools for the world's largest open source company. I've also had op opportunities to meet and help educators, scientists, and other folks around the world um, that I never would have encountered otherwise. Uh, and my own hope is that our community will continue learning and growing and finding ever more opportunities to help each other improve. So, thank you for your time. Uh, and. Any questions? <laughs> so, and yeah, uh, there's some interesting links if uh, people want to start exploring this topic in a lot more depth. So, so question and a thought. Um, what are your thoughts on when people in like a community can gather on something that's not community related? And to make this a little clearer what I'm talking about, there's a Slack group that it's all people in tech who craft. And so it's knitters and sewers and quilters. And we all sit around and we talk about our knitting and our sewing and our quilting and um, core dumps at the same time. Cool. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've had any thoughts like about how that could fit into this idea. Like yes, yeah, I, so, so one of the things I don't, didn't really talk about here at all is the question of uh, having opportunities to be a whole person. Uh, and so it's like, because um, I, I actually find Twitter wonderful for this because uh, it's the like, when you're, on, when you're on an IRC channel or a mailing list, then it's like you're kind of really obliged to stay on topic for whatever that list is about. Um, whereas when you're chatting to people at lunch at a conference or if you're chatting to people on Twitter, then it's like you can talk about whatever and you actually get to know more of the actual person rather than the person in the context of a particular task. And yes, I think it's very cool and leads to a lot more of that, um, the trust, uh, trust building and all that sort of stuff. So. Um, so I just wanted to ask, isn't it uh, mandatory or isn't it required to you, uh, give back to a technology? Like say uh, Instagram is using Django, but they're not giving anything back to Django. So. Isn't so, it their responsibility to uh, give something back to the technology they are using? Yes, so one of the interesting developments on that front is they actually are sponsors of the Django Software Foundation now. Okay. Uh, but yes, uh, there, there, there are one of the reasons I've been giving variants of this talk for going on four years now uh, is 
basically kind of nudging a few companies that tend to take open source for granted yeah. uh, as, hey, this is not maintained by magic internet pixies. People do need to eat. Yes. Um, it would help if you paid them. Uh, so, so yes, uh, there's, yes. <laughs> Uh, th there's definitely a lot of active work going on with people talking to particular companies and saying, hey, you're depending on this stuff. You should be investing in making it sustainable. So. I'm at the back. <laughs> That's me. Uh, Nick, thanks for this talk. Uh, I also had a query about uh, what what are your thoughts on companies sponsoring, like multiple companies sponsoring a single open source project? Like we have OpenStack. I think it's being funded by a large number of yep. uh, corporates. Uh, uh, and oftentimes it appears that like at least to an outsider, like I uh, like sometimes there may be competing requirements because even they are like that in a cooperation model. So I, how I, do I don't think that's an appearance. I think that's a fact. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So how, how what are your viewpoints on uh, how such type of projects can be taken forward? Uh, so so um, one one of the notions I kind of believe in uh, is uh, let's you and him fight, uh, and it's one of the challenges when you have just one or two big companies involved in open source community. Uh, is it's very easy for them to dominate the conversation just from sheer weight of time and money. Um, uh, and, so, uh, and so the beneficial thing you can get when you have more companies involved uh, in a co-opetition model uh, is that to a certain degree they tend to neutralize each other uh, and the community has more of an opportunity to have a voice. Um, and so yeah, and so, and so it's, it's definitely complicated because what's in the interest of the company is not necessarily what's in the interest of the project. Uh, and so like, uh, and so this is why I'm thoroughly biased in favor of the Red Hat model, which is the project is not the product. Uh, and you always reserve that ability to have a divergence between them. Uh, but yes, it's, it's defini definitely a thing of corporate politics, Corporate uh, community politics doesn't get easier when you add corporate politics. <laughs> That's just life. <laughs> I think that is all. So thank you. Thank you, Nick, for awesome presentation.